So this week's podcast is a little bit different to usual. Um, it's a two-part podcast and it's a very powerful story from a friend of mine who was imprisoned from a bad decision he made in his early 20s. Um, I think it's a, it's a very important story to share and, and really to demonstrate how us as an industry can support young people to take a positive path in their life rather than to drift into crime as a result of mixing with the wrong groups. The first part of this series really explains some of the horrendous outcomes of, this, of the decisions that he made and the consequences of making that decision. And the second part really demonstrates how someone's got the ability to turn their life around. And finally, the, the conclusion is really what lessons that you can take from this and how you can avoid probably going down a path that, that Brendan did. And, and, and the, the thing that's really most powerful about this is, is Brendan comes from an upper middle class family, um, you know, absolutely normal life. And, and you know, there was nothing really wrong or difficult about his upbringing. And, and yet even someone in that position uh, can be very easily influenced to go down the wrong path. So I think it's just a great example of how getting people into some sort of fitness or sport or positive community organization can really help people and, and, and the part that we can play in an industry to encourage that. Hope you enjoy the episode and I'd love to hear what you think about this one. Today's guest lived a life of luxury in the VIP clubs of Hollywood when things quickly took a turn for the worse. Tempted by $50,000 for picking up a package from Brazil, he was busted for smuggling and sentenced to a period of violence, cockroaches and intimidation in the most dangerous, overpopulated prison in South America. Since then, he has dedicated his life to education and events after founding an inclusive community for bodyweight fitness, encouraging anyone to get out there and move. Please join me for a breathtaking story from movement specialist and CEO of the World Calisthenics Organization, Brendan Cosso. Welcome to the Escape Your Limits podcast. So what's happening in the world of calisthenics? Uh, this weekend, are you coming next weekend? Um, the bars are just winning the kids. Okay, probably. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're there. We're there in the Fit Expo. Yeah. Yeah. Melanie, the Dutch girl, she, three months ago, she, she messaged me on WhatsApp. She was like, she calls me Brenny Bren. So, Brenny Bren, I want to battle. I was like, I don't have any girls that are of your caliber to bring to LA. You know, I've got a certain budget with my sponsorships and I can't fly another person out from Europe. I just don't have it. And she's like, no, I don't want to battle a girl. It's like, what? And what is battle? Just, just for the people listening. Um, go head to head on, on the bars. You know, right. In, in a calisthenics, in a freestyle calisthenics competition, muscle ups, front levers, all that kind of stuff, back flips. So it kind of took me by surprise. I was like, well, LA is an eight man tournament. And she's like, yeah, I want in. I was like, but you're a girl. <laughs> and she's like, and? So I was like, you know, and there's this, this whole thing with people see it and become semi-intimidated, right? Where these dudes are doing crazy body weight stuff, you know, planches and backflips. And, and so it, it, and it is a semi-male dominated sport or was. Now we've got a lot of girls that are coming up and for her to be one of the top females to ask to battle a bunch of guys. So literally she's going to go... It's a single elimination tournament, right? So we've got, you know, the first two people are going to battle to move on to the, it's going semifinals, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals. She's got the first battle against this guy, Kyle, and then we've got four other battles, and then it goes down. The, there's not a high likelihood that she's going to win because there's some pretty crazy guys that are competing, but the fact that she wants to test herself a bunch against, potentially, you know, battling three different guys if she passes to the next next uh, round I was kind of I talked to my matchmaker Jarvis and we were like why not why not do it you know what I mean what's what's to stop a female from beating a guy females wrestle there's some females that I would not get in a cage with right there shouldn't be any difference when it comes to something like this there is the physiological difference but I, I really don't think when it comes to sport that there should be this sport especially that there should be so much 
distinction that, oh, it's only a male dominated sport or only female, that there can be a mix. We're the first ones ever really like to put them against each other, toss a girl <laughs> in and we didn't announce it to any of our competitors. We didn't tell any of them. We planned it to where we had a WhatsApp message and we told everybody on Instagram, we'll WhatsApp all the competitors, let you guys all know who's competing. And within that list of eight people is Melanie. The minute we sent that out, it was what, what, <laughs> what, what the fuck, bro? What do you mean Melanie's battling? Who's she battling first? And they they all got worried. <laughs> like, I got to go up against a girl because you know, for a guy, losing to a female can deflate your ego a little bit, <laughs> yes. right? Especially in a sport you're good at. But if you're a real competitor, you need to respect the fact that she beat you. Yeah. And it's not a male female thing, it's a performance. If she beats you in a performance, step it up. She is uh, she's a phenomenal athlete. So give her a chance. Yeah. You know, maybe it becomes something that people want to see more of. Yeah. We're doing it for a first time. If if people want more, we'll we'll do it. We just want more females coming into the sport where we're able to now have girls a, a good stable of female athletes which is growing european market especially like the female population of calisthenics in europe is crazy yeah. like they're and, and they're crazy strong so it's i want to see more girls you know we're 78 percent male dominated by what we're doing you know when you look at the analytics on our social media and stuff it's and it's starting to it was 12 percent female and over the last like six months it's starting to climb up and you know the male ratio is lowering, which we want. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it like at a 60, 40, yeah. 50, 50 men and women. Cause this is something that anybody can do, not on the competitive level, but you know, it's, it's just, I think it's the most fun you can have when it comes to working out and enjoyment. You know, yeah. I, I don't know, I mean, that's my opinion. People like lifting weights for enjoyment. I think be able to move your body really well and efficiently is more enjoyable because you can't go deadlift 400 pounds at the park but if there's some monkey bars you can go have a lot of fun yeah, yeah. you know what i mean so 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 take us back a little bit just for the listeners to sort of understand a bit about who you are and where you started so so give us a bit of background on yourself where you grew up family um i i grew up the literally the typical upper middle class father attorney you know, not given everything, but never struggled for anything, right? You know, always had a, a nice home and et cetera. And grew up in our Pasadena, California, born and raised, moved to Arcadia. And, uh, you know, that's where I went to school. That's where most of the craziness in life started. And, and just a regular kid, you know, a little bit, little bit on the wild side, but a bit rebellious. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit, a little bit. I had the older brother, right? Which the older brother is always the, the first baby so then comes a second and like there's there's a funny commercial like i can't remember if it's like a, a, a auto parts an auto insurance commercial but you know it's first son oh and so careful with and then like second one comes like yeah just throw him on the floor and you know give him a burrito type of thing he'll be okay you know so it's being the second son and then i had a little sister so now i became the middle kid so my thing was like okay you got new sister older brother, no attention, like the attention for me, I could skip around and like hop back and forth and do what I wanted and not really get caught many of the times because they were worried about the younger sister and then my older brother. So I kind of had a little bit of the wild side when I was growing up. Right. But you know, I came from the regular, regular upper middle class family. Yeah. You know? And what about, what, what, what did you when, you, when you left school, did you go on to college, university or anything like that? So or? went straight to junior college. I I was a very smart kid in school, but didn't apply myself. And I was, didn't like authority too much. The only, I didn't like teacher authority, I liked coach authority, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like a coach that disciplines you, I liked that. I didn't like teachers saying, you know, read your book and stuff like that. So I, I had that little anarchist part of me. And um, after school, I went to junior college, went and did that, because I, I did want to study, wanted to get my bachelor's. Ended up getting that later, but you know, went and, and studied to get my AA, 
was doing that and I started promoting nightclubs. And that's kind of where the disaster started to take place because you live in this fantasy world. So you was in, in LA? Yeah, it started that. in Pasadena at a club in Pasadena. I met some, you know, just going out with friends. I started meeting some club promoters. Then that family owned multiple nightclubs in Hollywood, like the whiskeys and stuff like that, the Adler family. So met those guys. And back in those days, we would just, you would start as like the street promoter. So they'd be like, all right, you want to be a promoter? Cool. Here's a thousand flyers, you know, hit the road. And you'd have to go out and hand people flyers. Like come to our club, come to our club. Half the people would, you know, fold them up and turn around, make sure you're not looking and toss, toss them, them away. <laughs> you know, so it kind of started with that, but we were able to, to bring in people and create an excitement. And me and my buddy, he started DJing. We started doing like the VIP rooms for Roxbury, which was one of the, the big ones back then. And it kind of went sideways from there. Right. You know, just the flashy lifestyle. I mean, people from all over, you get celebrities, you get rich people, everybody, you know, you get to kind of choose who you want, which kind of makes your ego out of whack. Really? You see people driving Ferraris and this, and you get to say, oh, nah, you can wait, bro. <laughs> you know, go to the side. So it, it gives you that, like, power, sense, power, of power. <laughs> sense of power that you're, you know, you run this place. In, so if anyone wants to get in, they've got to be yeah. You know, you've got to either be to on you. our VIP list, or you're going to wait there, you know, four or five weeks <laughs> until we recognize that you're there always, and then you get to come in, but you've got to buy the thousand dollar bottle service. So because it was always a sale, right? Always selling. You sell the nightclub, you sell the VIP room, you get the thousand dollar bottle sale, and it goes from there. Then you start meeting people, and then you know I met a, a, a crazy amount of interesting people that I'm still friends with today, you know, from the entertainment industry to just regular people. Um, one guy that I met back then became, you know, one of the big jewelers for all the rappers, Ben Baller Yang. He does like, he's the Korean jeweler. He's does the big diamond chains. And so he, all these people I still have a little connection with from way back in the day, but that's where other influence came in. You know, it was money. Everything's about money back then. You know, the glitter, the, 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 the thousand dollar bottle. You see someone buying a thousand dollar bottle, it's like, I want to buy a thousand dollar bottle. So that becomes the focus. And when that kind of becomes the focus, that's where, you know, when sell, that's where I met the guys. So what was it? What was it? Do you remember the night when you kind of met the guys it was, in question? <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, the typical night. I think it was like, um, oh God, that's the night. I think the Saturday night live crew was in town and they were all there it was like will ferrell and all those guys way back in the days and they were actually because of that night at the nightclub that's where they came up with the movie roxbury a night at the roxbury because of these two guys i remember them vividly that used to always come and spend a ton of money but they wore these bright shiny suits other story but you know that's it was i think it was a saturday night live cast was there and it was just one of those things, you know, one of the guys, the VIP guys, you know, shh, hey man, I see, duh, 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 yeah, let's sit and talk. And, you, and it just comes out, yo, you want some money? You want to do some extra work? So this was on a, on a Saturday night, you were just sitting yeah. in the VIP was, area. Yeah, and just talking, you know, you have to go out and speak with everybody because that's our job is making sure people are happy. Hey, what do you need? Da, 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 da. And uh, this guy had been there a few times. You so know, you recognized so, him. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so you have that little bit of relationship with people that it's like, yo, sit down, brother. Have, you know, have a champagne with us. Oh, yeah, cool. And then it just blossomed into, you know, a big steaming pile of shit when, when you really look at it because it was. So it what, was did, he, what did he say to you then? He was just like, yo, you know, I see you young. You know, you got any friends? You guys want to go make some money? It's like. So what went through your mind then? You know, did you know kind of know what he was going to talk about or not really in the beginning right because i'm like money in nightclub life like maybe this guy has nightclubs you know instantly i wasn't like oh fuck yeah we're gonna go traffic drugs it right. was like oh maybe this guy's got a club or something he wants us to do cool but then it started you know we want you to go down to brazil you know and you start mentioning brazil and first thing in my mind was all right hot chicks samba carnival we're in without even really thinking about what was next, like, and you're going to be taking a package to Europe. Right. Yeah. Did you, did, did I you? I didn't hear that. You didn't. I'm going to Brazil. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, eh, you, you, 
yeah, the packages and stuff. Did you kind you, you knew about you kind of knew what you was getting into, but you, you the money chose was right. You know, it, was, it was a shit ton of money. Right. So back in then, what was this ninety two? You know, it's a pretty decent amount of cash. Right. To go down and pick some stuff up. Remember back then there was there was none of these X ray machines where it was you go through a metal detector. They don't check your luggage. It, it was it was almost easy, right? It's like, yeah, sure. I didn't hear that part. I mean, like, money, Brazil, cool. Me and my buddies, we're rocking. Let's go. So what do you say? Say to your friends, look, we got to... Then, it, yeah, I just asked about, you know, a couple of my friends. I was like, yo, this guy wants to pay us some money to go down and take some stuff to Europe for him. You guys in? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Let's go. Then it became like the, the beepers. This was beeper day. There were no cell phones. Do, do, do. Oh, hold on, I gotta call this guy. Yeah, meet me at the place in South. So, so where did you, so you went, what did you go, Literally, go to LAX? Literally, a couple days later, the, he, he beat me, and he was like, meet up, let's meet up at Johnny's Cafe, which used, like, Johnny's Cafe, I think, is closed. It used to be on Wilshire. Wilshire and, I think, La Cienega. Right across the street, almost, from the Brazilian consulate. Let's meet, have breakfast, and we'll talk about business. Went and had breakfast, he's like, okay, here's you're gonna, you know, pulls out money. Here, this is for the trip. You guys have some spending money, you know. It was an envelope and it was solid, like solid. You could smell the money coming out of it, right? So I was like, okay, cool. Put it in my pocket. You know, we'll let you guys know in a couple of days when your flight's going to be because you got to go get passports. They had to buy us our ticket back then to be able to go get our visa. So we had to go get passports, do all that stuff. We had like three weeks, it was almost a month from the day we had agreed and then left. Because we had to go get visas, and it was only a 30-day visa back then. So you had to have your plane tickets, go apply, get your visa, and you're done. So we went and got our passports, visas done, and that was it. We, a friend of mine drove us to the airport. We got on the plane, came back four years later. <laughs> so, when you, so when you went on the plane then, like it was, were, you, were you kind of excited about like this trip in Brazil, or were you like kind of... Oh, no, stuck, absolutely. Did... It was... Well, I, the focus, you know, at 20, God, this was 1992, so I was 22 years old, you know, the, my mindset was Brazil, this exotic place that you only see on TV, right? It, it was in the back of the mind, like, yeah, we're going to trap, you know, pick up cocaine and take it to Europe, but it wasn't really reality, because we you're getting on a plane, you're going there, you know, you're, this is my first time out of the country. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is awesome. And we get there. Back in those days, you can smoke on airplanes. <laughs> to tell you how old that was. There were people that were smoking cigarettes on an airplane, you know, back in 90, 92. When we got there, reality set in. You know, where the guys that pick you up from the airport. So what, what were they like? They didn't look like businessmen. No? No. I mean, you, if you think of like the typical gangster, I mean, to even, not a Pablo Escobar-esque, you know what I mean? Like, you look at them and you go, yeah, let's just go with these guys. It, it was just that look. Like an intimidating kind of people. Yeah, they just they? look like, they look like they're, you can't really call it mafia, you know, a cartel. They looked cartelish. Right. You know, they just so. So it changed the mood. Yeah, it changed like oh, oh shit, this is really happening. Like okay, so now I get it. Did you did you kind of at the time think maybe this wasn't a good idea at that point or you, no 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 because I still had a lot of money in my pocket. Right. Right. So first thing was they drop us off at this really nice hotel called the Parthenon which is, you know, in, in a area of, of Sao Paulo. Uh, I think it was, oh my goodness, I'd like, it wasn't it beat up with, uh, it was another area in, in the Sao Paulo, nice area, where one of the big malls is. Beautiful room, I mean, you know, jacuzzi bathtub, really nice place, two-story apartment, because it wasn't a hotel room, it was more like a suite. apart hotels. Okay. They're called like apartment hotels, right? Where people <clears throat> own them, but they also right. rent them out. So, beautiful spot. You know, we got all this money and there's nightclubs down the street and 
we're four gringos that look like Americans, that look like kids that are, at, we're there to party. We're out to have fun. So, you know, we go out in nightclubs and it's, it's that thing. Back then, it wasn't a, a big influx of, of Americans going to Brazil and especially going to Sao Paulo. It was like the city of Sao Paulo was more Rio and, you know, the, the tropical paradise spots. Um, so it was, you know, that immediate attention. My buddy speaks Spanish. He's from Argentina, but his family's from Argentina, so he spoke Spanish, so we were able to, like, get along a little bit. Some of the people spoke English, and it was just like you knew it was America. So we had a great time. And then it, when things got serious, you know, the knock on the door, and they, the bag, they come walking in with the bags. Like, was okay. this in the morning one day? Yeah, right. and it was a change of hotels, too. And that's, that, that was where it really went sour, I would say, is good time having fun to a really sketchy time to where they come and go, we're moving. We're moving hotels. And it's like, where are we moving to? Santos. Santos is the port city of Sao Paulo. It was just like two hour drive, two and a half hour drive down the mountain to Santos. In the, and they put us in this hotel that was just like seedy as hell. And it wasn't even to stay like for a long time. It was just for that night. So they drove us down to Santos. We get in this hotel and it was just really weird environment. And that's when they came with the bag of, of, of drugs. And it was, I mean, you want to talk about a fucking movie? Pardon the French. You want to talk about a movie? It was a movie scene. I watch it now, and I, I, you know, I still picture all of this, just this duffel bag opening up and just, like, what you really see, the cops confiscating, like, bricks of wrapped coke. Right. And they're just... So they're loading the bag. Slow motion. That, no, they dumped out their duffel oh, bag. okay. Because it came in pure kilo form. Right. We had to break it down to be able to put it on our bodies. Right. So it was, you know, they left, and then it was our responsibility. We'll be back tomorrow, X time. Be ready. So what are they told you? You're going to have to somehow kind of hide it on your body. Right. So the thought was... Awesome. I've seen a ton of movies, right? I don't want to wrap this stuff. So Did they give you tape and stuff to do? Oh, we had tape. We had Vaseline. <laughs> we had plastic bags. We had everything, right? So, and the funny, the, the craziest thing is I absolutely hate the drug. I've never, we're Arcadia. There was a lot of, you know, it's a wealthier community. A lot of the people that would go to the nightclubs, I mean, Coke was a big thing back then, right? Everybody was doing, I hated the drug. I, I'm, I've never been a drinking guy or, a, or actually a drug using guy, but money came from it. So my drug was the money, right? But so I had never done this. I've never wrapped this. I've never been involved in this kind of, in, in that context, right? I've seen it. Everybody's, you go to nightclubs, you see people doing lines. Is that your preference? Whatever. So these things fall out and it's like, okay, be ready tomorrow. You got to have this stuff wrapped up, ready to go on your bodies. I was a lot bigger back then, so I couldn't put it here. I only had it on my legs. So I have to open now. I'm thinking, how, how, how are we going to do this? Because like, um, it smells really bad. So we cut open these kilos. We had 12 kilos total, four people. So we each had to have three kilos on us. Right? I open this thing up, and you pull away the tape, and it's just this massive yellowy white brick that you have to then break into powder to be able to put it in bags, to be able to roll bags, take the air out of them, roll them again, put tape, roll them to make each bag, you know, enough to fit here up to your armpit. So it's not, you're not walking around like this, but to make it work. So you have, you know, here, here, and on the inside of the legs. So literally within two hours, I was so messed up from the fumes because the, just the smell of this stuff, like it's not seeing things, but it's, it's just, you're actually getting high from it. It's really? pretty crazy because I mean, there's, I'm breaking up with <laughs> gloves and powder and I've got shit all over my arms and could, I'm just trying to figure out how to wrap this stuff up so we could take it. They're going to pick us up tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. So we end up getting it done. Actually, I have to say I did a pretty nice job. 
Did you, um, were you, were at that point, were you starting to get nervous? Oh, we were freaking out. Really? Oh, because it, it became a real quick reality. When you would move a hotel and then all of a sudden now there's a stuff on your bed, you're kind of like, oh. Did you ever think of trying to like say, Absolutely. let's run, sort of get out of well, here? Well, you can't, you can't necessarily run because we didn't know where the hell we'd go, right? Because right. we're in Santos in this port city, you know some pretty lively characters around Santos too. Right. So, you know, how do we get a taxi? What do we do? When we, they came and picked us up the next day, you know, all right, get yourselves wrapped up. They were there while we taped up because they wanted to watch us put it on our bodies. So they got there, you know, stripped down. I'm taping everybody up. I was the last one. I just put on my legs or so I did my own and out to the airport, you know, so you have, three hours almost in a car, sweating, knowing that you're now on your way to the airport, that this is really real, get to the airport, sketched out of our minds, everybody was a police officer, you know, as calm as you could be, but also knowing like, oh crap, there's no turning back almost, right? So I went in the bathroom, Sebastian, my buddy, went into the bathroom. I think Guy and Julio were having a hamburger, and we were trying to be as normal as possible. Went into the bathroom, and I was like, I'm like throwing it away. I'm taking it off, <laughs> yeah. right? Let's dump this stuff, get on our plane. But then we get there, and the person meeting us on our plane, now we're going to Hungary, because that's where our destination was, was Hungary, and that's how it would get into Europe. How do we get, okay, so wait, what do we do? These people know where I'm, like, in L.A., they know my nightclub, they, you know what I mean? So it's like, then that starts to hit reality. Like, oh, if I throw it away, am I getting myself into something worse? You know what I mean? Because now I'm stealing drug traffickers money. And they're, so it became like a real eye opener at that point. Like, I, all right, it's, we just got to try this. We got to go. There's, there's no option if, you know, if you get a, I wasn't even thinking about being arrested. That literally never entered my mind. Not one bit. We were, I was way too nervous inside to think about that. I was more focused on this just, let's just get through that, that line, that passport line, where they let you go into the gate waiting area. That's all we care about. We're good. And got in the passport line, all separate. You know, you go in that line, I'll go in this line. Okay, four, four white dudes that look like they're all from California, dressed the same way in four separate lines, and dead giveaway number one. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I personally don't think that we were caught by being caught. I think that we were set up to a certain extent for a big shipment to go through. Like, we were the guinea pigs in many ways, I think, personally, um, because all the attention went to us. So we get there, we're in the passport line, and literally it was you, the officers, the federal police officers in Brazil that are at the airports are dressed to the nines. Suits, perfect shoes, ties. I mean, you look at these guys like Giorgio Armani designed their suits, you know what I mean? So it's like you start looking and, and more suits are around, and you know, okay, I'm getting to the line, and then there's another guy over there, and ooh, this guy's got to, these guys all kind of look alike. And then it's just the tap on the, literally, <sighs> tap on the shoulder. Mm -mm. <laughs> come on, come with us. And then it was just one, two, three, four. The craziest thing is, this is the weirdest story. So I had told my dad, because I was working at the time too, right? So I had told my dad, oh, I'm going to go do construction with some friends in San Diego because I was going to be gone for at least a week. So I just made up a story that I'm going to go do stupid story. So we're getting arrested. My father is an attorney in, in Arcadia. His partners in his law firm had a friend that was in Sao Paulo Airport, in Guadalupe Airport standing two aisles over from us, didn't know who I was because I'd never met them. We get arrested, they pull us aside, 
put us in these little areas, you know, these little cubicles, and you know, take off your clothes. You know, I'm not taking off my clothes. You know, you're trying to act like you're not wrong. Like, what are you, a pervert or something type of thing? And they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up, kid. Take off your clothes. So I take off my shirt. I'm like, nothing. Sebastian, and they all had it up here and on their legs. They take off their shirts. Boom, they see it. And I was like, see, nothing. Can I go? They're like, no, 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 no. Take off your pants, too. I was like, mm, damn. I'll take our pants off. We got it all. So reality hits. We're busted. Done, done, done. The person that was friends with my dad's partners, because I didn't call my dad, I don't think, for it was about two and a half weeks after we got arrested. So he had, my family had no idea where I was. That lady ended up going to Clay and Elaine, the Wilsons, which were my dad's partners at the time, still are. Um, told this story to Clay and Elaine. Oh my God, I was in Brazil and I saw an arrest. These drug traffickers got arrested. It was all right there. The police came and got him and pulled these kids aside. That kid was me. How crazy is that? Like that my dad now is sitting in an office hearing this story from some random lady. She's telling a story about his son. And when did he know? Did he know at the time? No, he had he... no idea. He's going, oh, wow, man, that must have been... You know, you saw this happen in the airport. Oh, you know, crazy story. So they they, they take us from uh, you know the airport. They we get locked up in the airport jail for a little while, and then they transfer us to the federal police station. And when you when you kind of when they they saw um, that you had it on it, you know, what what were you like? Were you just totally freaking out when that happened, or were you was it a relief? Or? To, when I say relief, almost like, you're, okay, you're, look, yeah, I'm, you're absolutely right. It, it was, it, it was, God, it, it, I don't even know if they can, the, the words can combine. It was like, you know, a relief and a tragedy at the same time. Right. Like, cool. I don't have to feel it. Any, like, yeah, uh, right. We're done. Like it's, the stress is over. Now I just got to feel like, right, how the hell are we going to get out of this? Right. Yeah. Right. So that knowing that like you don't know what is going to happen or you see movies you see all this crazy crap about you know south american prisons and russian gulags and you're i'm just going oh my god what's going to go and i told all my my friends i said i'm not calling my dad no way we're disappearing end of story like we'll figure a way out of this some way shape or form but i'm not calling my father no way i'm telling him that i did this and they put us in, they take us to the federal prison, right? In the federal, the federal building, the, they're like little jail cells, and it's already full. So they don't have any place to literally put us. And still, to this time, this is maybe eight or nine hours in the airport jail, and then get over the federal, so, you know, good 10-hour period. We still had the drugs on us. Like, we're walking around every place they put us, Still with that, they never took it off us the whole time. Got to the federal building, no space available, so the only place they could put us, once again, with all of our clothes on, street clothes, money, our luggage, still strapped with cocaine, in between two floors in an elevator. One security at, the bot at floor one, one on floor two, so if we tried to get out of the elevator that they'd catch us, they literally put us in between two floors as ourselves for two days. Brought us, you know, little these little like things, they call them bandejos, they're little like um, restaurant takeaway things with you know an egg and some rice and beans and a piece of funky meat. So they literally, we feel the elevator go up, they'd open up the doors, hand us a bottle of water, hand us a little bit of food, beep, they drop us back down. <laughs> so we're sitting here literally with packages of cocaine in one corner, our clothes, you know, everything we have and we could have literally just gone head first and just opened those bags up and just thrown it everywhere it was still with us and so we're just going what the hell i don't get this this is really strange so then they finally take us you know two days later they process us and tell us you know you guys are here for good and 
Then we go to the first prison. It's like a police station type of prison. It's a federal police building, which is a basement. You know, about six and a half foot ceiling type of thing. 150 so odd people. The worst you could possibly think about from drug traffickers to visa people to people that have fake passports to murderers to rapists, whatever. They're just all thrown in this place. There was an escape. After the escape, we didn't leave. We didn't run. Um, I, we could have, but that's that was like... A, couple weeks after my father came and visited and was like no matter what you do don't don't escape how did you how did you when did your father find out about it how did that happen oh whew. so that was they came about and that we had been transferred to the federal police station the the basement the cops were actually really cool you know and in 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 retrospect some of the police officers were really nice some you got to understand and i get it they're you know they're cops they hate people like me right you know, quote unquote. Um, but there also is a level of respect when you go into prison of what our crime was. Because first thing that everybody knows before you get into jail, all the inmates, they all, everybody knows what your crime is. Mm-hmm. And you can't BS about your crime. So if you're like the, the, mur- the rapist or the child molester or the person that hurts kids or women, you don't have much chance. Like you really don't. Um, so they put you sometimes in segregated population and stuff, but everybody pretty knows much knows who's coming in. So it was kind of like people that were, ah, we got some gringos that wanted to be powerful. And then others that were like, oh, dude, these guys are international drug traffickers. Like they're not, you know, petty criminal type of things. Right. <laughs> so we had that little bit of respect, but then others were, were like, you're always going to have those haters, so to speak. So it was a, you know, we were in there and, and made some friends. You can't call them friends, but acquaintances, just because you've got to be able to get by. And one of the officers, because we had money in our pockets, so literally the federal cops would come and go, you guys hungry? Yeah, okay. Um, what do you want? And the Nigerians were like, yeah, someone, tell them what you want. Like, okay, um, pizza? <laughs> okay, you want beer? Sure. Literally, they'd order pizza six pack of beer and you'd give them cash they'd open up the cell with everybody and deliver you a pizza and six pack of beer so we're going what the it doesn't make sense so the nigerians ended up paying so uh, hindsight now the cop after after this treatment so come in and says you know you guys want a phone call so that my buddy sebastian and guy and they're like dude call your dad please call your dad like because he's the lawyer, right? So he could figure it out. So I remember rotary dial phone, you know, you had to dial like 87 numbers and it's got this long delay in between speaking. So it's ringing and... Uh, did you plan what you was gonna say to him and did you have that kind of worked out? No, no. I, I had no idea what I was gonna say to him. I mean, yeah, it goes through your head. Like, what am I gonna tell my dad? Like, what am, how am I gonna tell him that I'm, you know, in? Brazil, first of all, <laughs> let alone Brazilian prison, and um, got on the phone, you know, it was like four or five rings, and it's, you know, you, you hear those, like the European ring, like, doot, and then it's got the time space, and doot, and after like four or five rings, it seemed like an hour, you hear, you know, hello, dad, delay, B. You sound far away. I was like, all right, listen, I'm not in San Diego. I came to Brazil. I'm in jail for trying to smoke cocaine. You know, a little bit longer than a normal delay. And his first words were, all right, where are you at? We're going to come get you out. I was like, Okay, here, boom, 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 told him where we were. He ended up feeling like, he ended up saying, wait a minute, Elaine's, Clay and Elaine's friends, you were the fuckers that they told me about a couple weeks ago? I was like, what do you mean? Oh, Clay and Elaine's friends were there and they said they saw these American kids get arrested. And he's like, that's you? I was like, oh my God, yes. So he said, I'm coming down. So he grabbed ultimately one of my mentors, Bob, um, Gruber that owns Semco Fitness, that's where I got my start in fitness. 
Um, they'd been best friends since elementary school. So he was like Uncle Bob. And Uncle Bob was crazy, but he was a great businessman. So he said, perfect. So they literally went and got 100 grand cash. So literally, I think it was about a week later. Gringos, got a visit. They open up this cell, walk out to this little area, and there's my dad and Uncle Bob, you know, with a sachet with $100,000 in it. First of all, he had to lie about that money. So now I'm thinking, oh, my God, dude, like, you could now go to jail because you lied about flying to another country with that type of cash because you have to fill out your customs report, right? So now my dad's risking going to prison for... You know, God forbid they, they catch him for like trafficking money, money or something, laundering, right? Yeah. Money laundering. Um, they show up and it was that immediate breakdown, obviously. Like, oh my God, Dad, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I still feel it. He slapped me so hard that it was just one of those pow. The people in the jail were probably like, oh, oh. And he said, all right, let's figure out how we're going to do this. So he went and hired the best lawyer. Um, had them jump immediately on our case. And his last words to me before they left, after we had a couple pizzas and stuff, I said, you know, and my, my father is the king. I think that's where my foul language comes from because I love saying the F word a lot. Um, but we all call my dad the F bomb because he drops them a lot. So he literally looked me straight in the eye and said, don't you fucking escape from here. You'll run the rest of your life. That resonated, right? I mean, it's still like, is because we had an opportunity. So they leave. There's this escape opportunity. The Nigerians ended up paying the federal police to bring in hand tools. You know, we literally, Shawshank Redemption, literally drilling the mortar out between bricks because it's so humid. Like you could scrape it with a, a metal knife and the concrete would just fall out. So it's literally, you know, scraping, drilling a poster. You know, cops would come in and inspect, but they would never go to that poster. And literally the basement was, you know, the ceiling was here where the parking level was of the, the house was here. So it's kind of those basements that still have the little windows above right, yeah. ground level. And that's where they drilled the hole. Boom. One night, everybody took off like flies. And we literally, I was able to literally stick my head out, still in street clothes. We still had money in our bags, everything. And like looking out, seeing cars passing by and not going and people going, you know, screaming like, go, go. Pulled back in and we're like, no, my dad said, I, and my buddies are going, dude, what are you doing? Let's go, let's go. And I said, no, I, I can't, can't go. You know, so it's, it's one of those. Probably big decision in your life. Man <laughs> moments, right? One of those man moments that you either man up to, to, to what you've done and accept it. Right. And or run the rest of your life. You know, if I ran the rest of my life, I just, that was more f for my parents and my family. Because for me, yeah, well, we, you know, anybody can disappear and that person it's easy for to a certain degree, right? Because you're the one leaving, but you're leaving a bunch of people behind that are now don't know your whereabouts, live, dead, you know what I mean? So decided to stay, suffer the consequences of some really stupid actions. And, uh, Did you get into trouble for that event? I know sometimes you watch on TV, like all the people that, you that know, are, are part, well, even the people oh, who are yeah. part of the group who don't escape kind of, oh, yeah. did, did you get? Oh yeah, yeah, it was painful. Really? Oof. They have these rubber batons that hurt. Right. So, you so know, even, people, even you that didn't go, they just did, went oh, through yeah, everyone. Oh yeah, the consulate, you know, love our government, no matter how, we were the, the idiots, right? So consulate came so after the breakout. There was, I think, uh, 122, 126 people in the jail, in the basement. I think 26 or 27 out of the 50 that escaped, 26 or 27 came back. They caught them. Three or four of them were killed. You know, please, please don't tell you to stop. They just freaking shoot you. End of story. A couple of them were killed. Couple guys that got brought back were just beat to shreds, um, and then everybody that stayed had to suffer that consequence for not ratting out. Obviously, during the time of the hole being built, so everybody in there knows. So the people that didn't go, so you know it's line up, 
your best to line up and you turn around and you just have a big ass baton. Calves hurt, front of the shins, ooh, painful. And then it's being whacked on the back with, you know, a rubber stick. That was the only time that like the cops ever really hit us, you know, because what are you going to do? Yeah. So the consulate ends up coming, you know, and oh, and we're like, yo, this is torture, you know. They look at us and go, and? <laughs> what do you mean, and? Like, I want, my, I want my rights, you know, human rights. They're like, no, like, you don't have any rights. Do you know what you did? Um, so that's the eye opener, right? That's the big eye opener when your government looks you in the face, even after you've been hit with a rubber baton and goes, F you. It sinks in at that point that you go, yeah, right? What I did was a pretty serious crime. Like, it's, it's, hmm, it's no joke. So now, you know, then it you go to jail. It starts hitting reality. Yeah, it starts hitting reality. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, you start discovering God and, you know, God, please take me. And not that I don't believe in God or anything, but that's, you know, just to be bluntly honest, everybody discovers God the minute they get to jail, right? Because they think... I think the good Lord's gonna gonna talk to the judge and and help them get out of jail. Or so it's you know it's oh God please help me I'll never do this again. And so you left you left the the like a temporary jail and you went yeah. into a, so a problem. It was it was it was a couple four five six month process to get sentenced. So it was a transfer. Like we spent a couple months in the the basement jail. Then they moved us over to. A, poli a couple police stations in transit. So we go spend a couple nights in a police station here with like, you know, I'd say a 20 by 20, 25 by 20 cell with maybe 80 people in it. Like literally blankets tied to the bars and those were hammocks, like seven people high. So we spent a couple days in there, witnessed some pretty crazy stuff. Um, then they sent us to detention, which is the, called Casa de Detención which was where do you, you remember the movie that came out called cut and Diru? No. great film it's literally about the prison system that i was in it's it's amazing film um i think rodrigo santoro one of the brazilian actors was in it he did like all the, the charlie's angels movies and stuff he was the guy in 300 the, oh, okay yeah so they literally did a movie on pavilion nine so they took us to detention which is one of the main facilities and we spent a couple days there that's where the big massacre happened where the cops came in and killed like a couple hundred people because they were complaining they needed water and they thought they were going to make a rebellion so the military police leader just said go in and handle it they went in and just whacked out like 350 people the news was 111 but a couple people i was in jail with were actually part of that troop that went in and killed all these people they were like we killed 400 at least Right, so you know they. And that we was was there. that while you was there, or, or no? That no. we literally went to that prison nine months after the massacre happened. Right. So you know we're driving into this place, and like you could literally see, you know, one, two, and then Pavilion Nine as you're going by, and you could see out these little holes. You can still literally see the bullet holes because the cops were in their helicopters too, trying to shoot in the cell door, the cell windows to just kill the prisoners. So I mean, you're you know, seeing bullet holes riddled outside of the wall and you're going what the f is this it, it, it's a movie and in your it, it was I'd like, I'd, it's a bit of a stupid question <laughs> was were you terrified at that point absolutely or, yeah well you know terrified all depending what the terror is right you know i'm not worried about fighting like whatever i can handle myself you know Someone's going to die. You're either going to kill me. I'm going down fighting or it's you. Right. So I wasn't really too concerned about like the violence or defending or because or, me and my friends, you know, we spent our, our high school years fighting in the streets and meeting at Bob's Big Boy and fighting the guys from the other high school. So, I mean, you know, that's but you start getting into things where it's like you get knives this big, you know, that everybody's got and it turns into a. A thing where I think the most terrifying thing was, was not the jail part, was the part of what could potentially happen. That 
the thought of thinking you may have to kill people is pretty terrifying. And that's immediate. You, your switch clicks on and you see this and you're like, oh, no. You know, because you're walking in and gringo, you know, the hollowed walls and people are literally, a lot of people, it, it was, very, uh, prisoners were very cool. A majority of the prisoners were like, you know, we were drug traffickers. We were the, the, the cartel type of thing. Four Americans, yeah, you guys tried to get a little... So we did have a little bit of that, you know, camaraderie, if you can call it. Um, but yeah, I think the most terrifying thing was the thinking of what would potentially have to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I die, eh, I die. But then the thought of that is, my God, my parents... You know, they don't know if I'm alive or dead every day because they don't hear from me for months at a time yeah. unless the lawyer comes and visits. So the terror was more not of, yeah, we're in jail because that was just a realization like you're not getting out. There's Did you know how long you were going to be in there for when you got sentenced? So this is the part where I hate my lawyer, but I also love him at the same time. So the tough love part of it, my dad hired this phenomenal attorney um, that literally had written laws. Right, so this guy was top notch. That hundred K cash went to him in his office. He came to us, you know, first day, Ringo's, you have a, a visit. And we're like, who is it? And they, they walk you through, you have to go through these big doors, and then you get to stand out, and it's called the parlatorio, the talking place in, in Portuguese. Lawyers are sitting down, you got a little fence, and you get to stand there while the police are looking at you, and you stand up and it's this lady named Joanna and Paulo. Paulo speaks no English. Joanna speaks some English. It's his assistant. Hi, boys. Hi, who, who are you? This is Paulo da Costa. He's your attorney. We're here to tell you guys, you know, what's going to happen and how things are going to go. First of all, you guys need to keep it up, you know, do what you need to do in here. Be smart, you know, take care of yourselves and uh, don't do anything stupid. And number two, just know right now that the judge, because we've already spoken to him, he wants to give you 25 years. That's when a big F you came out. Like I was enraged, like, fuck you. I'm not spending 25 years here. There's no way. And then he looks at us and goes, son, you know, he says, a filho, starts talking in Portuguese and I'm going, and she's, He's saying, son, do you have any idea what you guys just did? Not one of you. It's four of you. That's considered a gang. So you know, you're not just drug traffickers. You're a gang of drug traffickers. It's a cartel. That's another crime. Do you have any idea what you did? And then it really starts to sink in like, oh, no. Wow, this is no joke. Like, I could potentially spend 15 to 16 years in a Brazilian prison, if you survive those years, right? And then he looks at us and goes, 